Thank you, John. Uh, got Genomics 101 last night over dinner. So uh, I learned a lot in the last day and a half. So it's, it's been a very valuable time here and learned from many people many different things. So I, I trust over the next 45 minutes or 44 and a half minutes that I can share with you some of my experiences in Build versus Buy and perhaps help uh, that learning continue on into this morning. Um, just tell you a little bit about myself. I began my career in the telecommunications industry in a research facility in Ottawa. And um, the reason I, I, I felt that maybe I can add some value to this discussion is because I've probably made as many mistakes as, as, as I have successes in this area of build versus buy. So in this organization, we designed telecommunications gear that, that was sold all around the world, and we built everything. I, don't think we bought very much. We may have bought some capacitors and resistors, but all the silicon pretty well we designed ourselves, all the boards we designed ourselves, the chassis we designed ourselves, even the bolts that bolted the chassis to the ground were specially designed for our system so that they would sustain earthquake damage. We designed our own programming language for call processing. We designed the operating system and the compiler. Everything, even the, well, just before I joined the organization in 1985, even the, uh, the processor was a proprietary processor. They later switched to a series of Motorola processors. Everything was built from scratch. I needed some new connectors for the I.O. card I was developing. Even those connectors, most of those connectors we designed from scratch for telecommunications requirements. We built everything. Um, as I was telling, I think, one of the other attendees last night that when that uh, switching fabric went into production, uh, from, from my understanding, and I followed it for my whole career there, uh, we never had a single field failure. But it took five years to develop that product from concept to in full production. That took a long time. I'm not saying we did everything right, uh, but certainly building everything yourself gave a unique perspective. Then many of us who found ourselves wandering the streets of Ottawa, figuring what to, trying to figure out what to do next after the dot-com bubble burst, we all did startups. So a lot of us did startups. And um, so one of the startups I got involved with, one of the few that actually had venture funding, was a high-performance computing startup. And we basically took the, um, it's around 2005, we took the AMD Opterons that were doing very well then, I think there was a short period of time when AMD had the edge over Intel in processor performance, and we really liked that hypertransport bus. And uh, being a lot of communications engineers, uh, we felt that we could, you know, take the uh, the Optron and the Mellanox silicon and put an FPGA in between and write our own protocol stack. Um, because that's what we were good at. We were good at communications protocols. We were good at building, and we built everything ourselves. We built our own. Well, we didn't do our own processors, uh, and our silicon was FPGAs. We bought the most expensive and fastest FPGAs we could, we could find. We put all of our intellectual property in there. We rewrote everything in the InfiniBand stack above layer two. We did our own MPI. We did our own boards. We did our own chassis. You get the picture there. And in about three years, we built a machine that I benchmarked personally against uh, the Cray. I forget the generation of the Cray, but it was the same Opterons actually ordered the exact same memory versions that they ran wharf simulations on, and I had some public benchmarks. And we actually ran, outran the Cray at that time. That was around 2006. We put a system into NASA, put a system into Lawrence Livermore, put a system into a number of different customers in the U.S. And... Uh, met all the benchmarks, met all the entry criteria, um, but we didn't sell enough. And the uh, venture capitalists got cold feet and eventually pulled the plug. So we built almost everything ourselves. We did buy, we did partner on a few things. Um, and in hindsight, when everyone was doing the retrospective, we all said, well, maybe we shouldn't have built this ourselves. Maybe we should have bought this or partnered with this. And we, we did that analysis. Uh, I tell a lot of people I have a $40 million education in high-performance computing, and that was, was, was through that time. So that's kind of where that comes from. Now I'm in a, in a publicly funded role where I'm looking at supercomputing technologies across the universities, and I was actually on a panel just a few weeks ago, and the subject of build versus buy came up again. 
about whether we should be building our own data centers or buying them or you know going through cloud services and that it reignited that debate and in fact I have that debate almost every day as I work with startups who a lot of the startups are just brilliant brilliant young people they're amazing coders and they want to build everything themselves from scratch and I said well wait a minute you know you can learn from my failures maybe and just think through these things so when it comes to build versus buy there is no correct answer but I think the key question here is are you asking yourselves the right questions and that's uh, that's a little bit of my introduction and myself uh, I've really been enjoying the talks here so far both the formal and the informal talks um, but after Shane's talk yesterday um, I decided to go and uh, resequence my slides. So the slides are not out of an, what would be considered a normal progression. So I was going to tell you a little bit about the innovation ecosystem in Ontario. And then the questions, as I discussed, I think build versus buy is about asking the right questions. It's not coming to the table with your preconceived answers. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I had some stories, but after Shane's talk yesterday, I pulled one of my stories up to the front. Uh, and I'm going to give a bit of a personal note. Now, I've never done this in a public lecture like this, but uh, Sh Shane opened his presentation with a picture of a, um, a premature baby. And uh, I guess Anthony will remember this, but I pulled up this picture on my phone. That's my son, Jonathan. And I had been talking, Anthony and I had been talking in the conference about the, uh, the trials in our lives and how they shape us and how they make us who we are and both the successes and failures and sometimes it's our spectacular failures where we learn the most but also the the bad things that happen to good people and we often wonder why these things happen but they make us who we are and you know the old saying what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and I'd say by the grace of God and through wonderful developments in technology and by some amazingly dedicated staff, there's Jonathan celebrating his fourth birthday cake last month. We didn't think Jonathan would make it. A day after that first picture, or two days after that first picture was taken, the doctor said, well, if you have any family members that haven't seen Jonathan yet, you should bring them in tonight. We really don't think he's going to make it to the morning. It's not a genomic story, and, and you know, Shane, you did a wonderful job in your talk yesterday. But it is a story of technology, of a little boy's fight for life, you know, about God giving us peace, because we had to make so many decisions. And we prayed about those decisions and asked for divine wisdom. And, and what to do, the doctors, would, teams of doctors would come to us and say, well, you know, if you take this course, these are the side effects, and if you take this course, these are the risks, and so on. And uh, we have a team of doctors, there's nine of us, and we won't tell you the vote, but uh, it's pretty well 50-50. It's your decision. And Jonathan's here today, and I just, every one of us who touches technology, especially those who touch technology in the healthcare sectors, we are doing modern day miracles with the tools that we have, and we're creating those tools new every day. I was really encouraged by, again, my Genomics 101 class with Ross, or John, last night over dinner. And the things that we'll be able to do even a year from now are things we couldn't do last year. And I'd encourage everyone, you know, as you're developing these new data technologies that are going to give us new insights into genomic therapies and new insights into diseases, um, to keep going. Uh, we're saving lives. And I just thought I'd give that little personal anecdote uh, this morning before I go on. So I have given some stories of projects that I've worked on. And I'm going to say at the outset, a couple of these stories um, may look a little bit like an IBM commercial, and that's not the intent. The intent is we do have a public-private partnership in Ontario with IBM Canada. And we've done a lot of really, really cool projects together. So this is a very short video clip. It gives you a break from my voice from a few minutes. Uh, but it's really well done. And when I went in to meet this professor with my colleague from IBM, we went to the university and we met this professor. Uh, this uh, professor was actually worked in Australia um, in the financial services sector. Now, I didn't hear the whole story, but it was my understanding through my colleagues at IBM uh, that she lost a child, a premature child uh, in Australia. And she decided to take 
I think she studied, had studied mathematics, and she decided to take what she learned about big data and apply it in the healthcare sector. And there was a small university in Ontario that said, you know, we'll go, we'll work with you on that. So she came to Ontario and became a professor at a, at a small new university. And she started working on analytics to save premature babies. IBM got behind her, uh, my employer, which I'll have a chart on that in a minute. We got behind her, funded the research, and um, that research developed tools that started saving lives, not using uh, genomics technologies, but using streaming data technologies. Um, and now we're, we're helping this professor to turn this, uh, turn this breakthrough into a startup. So I'll play, play the video clip, um, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is a baby. A baby generating data in a neonatal ward. Every heartbeat, every breath, every anomaly, from over a thousand pieces of unique information per second, helping doctors find new ways to detect life-threatening infections up to 24 hours sooner. On a smarter planet, analyze the data and you can predict what will happen faster. So you can do what they're doing in Toronto and build a smarter hospital. Let's build a smarter planet. I remember when I first took this job, my friends at IBM took me down to the T.J. Watson Center there just north of New York. And they played that video clip. And I, 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 I leaned over against uh, one of my university colleagues and I go, that's not what preemies look like. Uh, Shane showed a picture and I showed you my son. I said, that's not what preemies look like. That's, but you know, it's a, it's a cool little marketing video and uh, it's really interesting. The first disease that they were able to do diagnosis for was sepsis. So sepsis is a blood infection. Uh, as you can see from my son's photo, they're completely covered in wires and tubes and all kinds of things. And even though they are ca cared for in a near sterile environment, infections are very common. And in, in fact, sepsis is a blood infection and it can be fatal within 48 hours. The blood tests necessary to confirm a diagnosis of sepsis take 48 hours. And uh, nurses are going around and they're checking vital signs. And once an hour, they take the statistics in a clipboard of, and then they discuss it with the medical team in the NICU at that particular time. So what Carolyn McGregor, McGregor had done is take all this streaming data from the isolation units and from all the monitors and she started analyzing that data in real time, streaming data in real time. And through her research and the research of uh, the folks at the children's, uh, Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, and they were able to find uh, a diagnosis of sepsis within hours of of the infection setting in, and that's saving babies' lives. And in the build versus buy scenario, um, again, this is a brand new university innovation. And often, you know, professors, when they sit down with their students, they will build everything from scratch. In this case, they didn't do that. That's why I have the question there, build versus buy. Uh, they worked with IBM, and IBM provided them a pre-production version of their InfoSphere streams. And if I pronounced that wrong, my apologies to the IBM folks here in the room. But this is a pre-production version of InfoSphere streams, which analyzes and does analytics on data in motion. And in this particular thing, it was for neonatal data. Uh, and looking for early indicators of illnesses so that uh, clinicians could respond. My son Jonathan also had sepsis, and I don't think Jonathan would be here today if his nurse wasn't a, had 30 years experience in the NICU. Uh, she was the one that told the doctors what to do. And she says, I think, I think Jonathan has sepsis. Why don't you start treating him? We'll get the blood test done. But she said, if we don't treat him now, he won't live until the end of the, the blood test. Now there are blood tests available that can give you results in minutes, but we didn't have those at that time, at least not in Ottawa. So. Um, this technology is being commercialized. We're supporting it through its startup phases and startup funding. Uh, that technology is being used to search and research the data for other neonatal illnesses. Uh, when you have a premature child, they give you a chart, and there's about a dozen illnesses. And they tell you it's going to be a rough ride. You're not gonna, your child's not going to get all of them, but they probably get about half of them. And all of them are fatal if we don't respond immediately. And our son was true to the course. He had about half of them. Uh, but he made it through. Uh, this technology is even in its beta phase, and I'm sure if that's the right term right now. It's, pre it's not into production yet, but it's rolled out over, I think, about a dozen hospitals around the world as a research project. Um, 
And they're starting to use it now for other chronic care patients, like the very elderly. And so the devices that they're wearing to monitor, monitor their health is being monitored in real time. So it's just one of the stories of build versus buy. In this case, they were building a brand new technology, a brand new solution, but they were uh, on technology and cloud services that they bought from, from our research partner, IBM Canada. So now I'm going to go back to the beginning of my presentation, is just sharing that story, and it's a sample of some of the stories that are coming. So uh, as I've told a few people here at the conference, um, oh, there, there's the laser. Uh, these are the folks that uh, write my paycheck. So we'll talk about them a little bit first. So we're in the economic development role. Our primary responsibility is the commercialization of research. Uh, so we work with universities and research hospitals to see the, the new breakthroughs that they develop, that they turn into actual products and services that generate jobs and generate revenue for the province of Ontario. Um, I'm also on secondment to help the Ontario government establish a new entity which is called Compute Ontario. Uh, and because of the uh, policies in the province of Ontario, we have to have a logo that incorporates both official languages. So that's the English and the French. Um, and the purpose really there is that we have HPC centers in the universities. Um, I think there's at least seven or eight of them right now. We have HPC centers in the hospitals, most notably the Hospital for Ch Sick Children in Toronto. They're also doing a lot of genomic research. I'll do what I can to get uh, Shane an appointment to, to meet the genomic researchers there at Sick Kids. I think they'd, they'd have a lot to share with each other. Um, and then we have the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research also has their own cluster and does a lot of HPC related work. I was talking to Merle Giles who I met on the panel at Enterprise HPC in San Diego and we get into some conversation and we started comparing some notes and as a result of that session we're, we're looking at a pilot project and I'll be going to his public sector partnership forum in the beginning of May. Uh, we're probably doing a pilot project there. But he got talking to me again about our cancer center. He said, you know, some of the genomic um, simulations and, and methods that they're using there are excellent. We'd like to partner some more. So my objective is, again, to take all these entities in the province of Ontario and pull them together under a single strategic plan, and a single financing plan. One of the things we haven't done well in Canada is we haven't developed good, sustainable, long-term funding for HPC. So then thanks to Tom, when we were in San Diego, he introduced me to Larry Smarr, the, the, the person who originally wrote the original proposal for the first five uh, national supercomputer centers in the US. And I had lunch with him and it was, it was really amazing. He said, oh, you're from Canada. Yeah, have you ever worked with those guys in Ottawa at Bell Northern Research? I said, I spent the first half of my career there, which was absolutely hilarious. He'd done some projects with them when he was in Chicago. And I go, you know, there are, most of the people I talk to in Toronto have never heard of Bell Northern Research. And here I'm having lunch in UCSD and you ask me if I've ever worked with these folks. So that was a bit of a small world moment thanks to Tom and, and I really appreciate the introduction. The introductions, the, the connections I've made here have been great and again I really appreciate that. Little map, uh, I don't mean to be condescending but I do meet people, especially in the southern US, have no idea. Haven't even heard of Ontario, let alone know where it is. So we're at the, we're at the center of the universe here, as you can see. You know, we're right in the middle of everything. So uh, again, part of my job is economic development, and some of the vendors I've talked about here. You know, what what can we do to find a win-win situation for you to do more research with our universities in Ontario and develop products together in Ontario. Uh, so that's been my pitch to the vendors. They're supposed to pitch to us, but I've been pitching to them to come and, and do research in, in, with us in Ontario, just like we're doing with IBM. So, so I've been pitching to the vendors. I don't know if it was meant to be that way, but uh, I think they found that to be good conversations. We have also partnered with uh, the main venture capital firm in uh, in Canada, there's a pension fund, the largest pension fund in, in the province of Ontario, and I believe it's the largest pension fund in Canada, has developed a venture firm. And so we partnered with that venture firm for a high-end accelerator. And it's an environment, and I've got a chart on that as well, where we cultivate a community of very high-end data-driven startups. Most of them are serial entrepreneurs. Most of them are very young. And they're using data and data analytics tools. In some cases, they're using tools. In some cases, they're buying them. In some cases, they're building them. Um, but we're developing a community, and we're hoping that the next uh, Facebook or the next Twitter or the next Google comes out of our little offices um, 
right in the center of the Financial Services District in Toronto. We're actually in the same building as Google headquarters, but uh, our partner actually owns the building, so uh, we have uh, better strength on there. Uh, this is the partnership that we have with IBM, and I've got a chart on that, but it's basically we, again, I mentioned we don't adequately fund HPC on a consistent basis. And so some creative minds at IBM and the University of Toronto and the University of Western Ontario got together and said, you know, I think if we do this collaborative research project together, research that's computationally based using the latest data analytics tools and the latest HPC technology, we can work together to do, to do some very innovative solutions. And they used economic development funding to build some new HPC centers that was badly needed in the province of Ontario. Now, man, I got into a political fight, what you fight which you wouldn't believe, but that's a story for another time. Okay. No, I was pushing the laser. I hope I didn't blind anybody. Okay, there we go. So this is my employer, Ontario Centers of Excellence. So basically, we create partnerships between industry, uh, universities, colleges, and research hospitals to do research projects together. So this shows the funding cycle. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but you have government research funding. And then when research is just about ready, to make it into the mainstream. We help it with many of our funding programs. So we come on board even before angel investors and venture capital to bring technology out into the marketplace. And so we're, we have uh, statistics we're looking for. So really it's about job creations, jobs for those students. We don't want all of our top engineering and science grads moving to California. We'd like to keep some of that at home. So we, it's all about getting um, receptor capacity in industry for a lot of our very brilliant talent coming universities. Uh, we have, this is our own funding uh, into our core programs. And then we're measured on our leverage, how much we can leverage that funding that comes from the province. And that's industry sector funding. And in many cases, it's research funding from the feds as well to give us a multiplier. Um, and we work through across a number of sectors and we track follow on investment as well. So this is the, uh, the program that we have with IBM. So it's a public-private partnership uh, for collaborative research projects. The projects are filtered through a scientific advisory committee that looks at the, the uh, validity of the research, its benefits to society. So we're looking at a lot of healthcare projects, a lot of energy projects, and a lot of environment projects. Um, and so there has to be a societal benefit uh, in these uh, projects. Uh, we're looking at definitely commercialization of research in the point. It is Canada's fastest supercomputer. Um, and at the time, it was two racks of a blue gene. We've upgraded it to four racks of blue gene uh, last, just before, just before Christmas. So 64,000 cores. It's, it's impressive to have a machine of that caliber. I'm a hardware engineer, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool piece of equipment. Um, it's impressive to have that kind of capacity to apply to essentially a handful of projects to have that capacity and then have all the support, not only from IBM specialists, but also the, 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 um, the supercomputer team at the University of Toronto, which has a long history of supporting supercomputer applications. And to bring those teams' experience into the projects, many of them with startups. And then we also have a, uh, a lot of the IBM's analytics tools in a cloud environment at Western University. And to, to use those technologies, and again, it's a, it's a commentary on our funding. Uh, this is the most recent HPC acquisition in, in the province of Ontario. And although 64,000 cores isn't a small system, it is larger than anything else in the country that we know of. Now, I don't know what the, uh, our spooks have. I'm suspecting they have a cray that's even bigger, but nobody's talking about that. So, so Compute Ontario, again, it's a, it's a new organization, again, with a vision to... Uh, enhancing the, uh, the services to uh, the compute services to our researchers, but also it's a, we believe it's a driver for innovation and prosperity. And that's, that's really the focus that I'm bringing to it. We need to provide computing services to our researchers, but we also need to find ways that those benefits make it out into the whole society. We need good jobs for those students that are learning those HPC skills, uh, and we need to help industry employ these technologies for greater competitiveness. We seek to be a trusted partner. We, it's all about collaboration. Of course, we're, we're spending a significant amount of public funds. HPC systems are not cheap, and staffing them are not cheap. And uh, under um, 
and Ontario too, we're in a, in a deficit situation, so we have some serious budget challenges. And so we do have to make sure that we provide to the government uh, value for services and we seek to be innovative. And that's what we're going forward with. Uh, that's the accelerator I spoke briefly. So it's a community of uh, data-driven startups and uh, we, uh, you have already had a number of success stories. A number of the companies that are with us less than a year have scored a fairly significant Series A and are growing very quickly. Um, as we get into the examples, I just want to highlight that we are, I think it's, it's, it's not about having the right answer, but I think it's about asking the right questions. And I think as we get into the build versus buy discussion, I was again, I was at a panel uh, a couple of weeks ago um, Oh no, that was another form. I was at a, uh, we, we have a new partnership with the Toronto Financial Services Alliance where we brought together all the banks and most of the insurance companies to look at innovations to bring a number of the, um, number of these financial services companies together and solve problems together that they couldn't problem solve themselves with universities. And one of the professors made this statement, it's better to fall in love with the problem, and this is our financial um, insurance forum, uh, better to fall in love with the problem than the solution. Innovation is not about technology or startups. It's about bringing, bringing really smart people together and focusing on the problem and focusing on, on what we can do to fix that. Um, and as I, I was talking to one of the bank executives in preparation for our forum, he said, I'd rather have a startup conform to our needs than have us conform to the projects of a major vendor. And so the question I think when, when you are into the discussion of build versus buy is what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? Um, and I'll show this in a minute, but I was on a panel at another, at another forum and there's a lot of people that are on the side of building because they like to build. And I'm an engineer and I like to build. And there are people that are really say, well, you know, the trend is towards cloud services. Everything should go out. You shouldn't build anything. You should buy your services uh, in the cloud and do everything. Well, it depends on your circumstances and whether you build or buy um, really depends on, uh, on your circumstances and your environment and the answer isn't always what you might expect. So there I am on the, um, uh, on the panel with my friends from uh, IBM Softlayer and this is from Alberta. I spoke to a gentleman from Alberta last night uh, that knows the folks that run cyber. Cybera out in Alberta, so we had, uh, which is a publicly funded cloud services organization in the province of Alberta, and the folks from Rackforce. And so we got into the debate about build versus buy and cloud services and how more, much more cost effective. And I'm sitting here uh, representing the universities who would rather build. So it was a rather interesting discussion. And these are some of the points that we came across. And again, I related my experience from the telecommunications vendor. We had standards that we had to hit. We had a standard where the system had to be available all the time. Uh, we had, I think, a planned outage or an unplanned outage specification of less than two minutes per year. Uh, when you have that kind of specification, you tend to build everything from scratch. Uh, so you need to look at your organizations, you need to see the standards uh, and the compliance requirements that you have. If you can't buy that and if you can't some sort of, you know, meet those requirements with your vendors, and uh, again, we have the experience now where we treat our vendors as partners. If you can't get there, then sometimes you have to build it yourself. Um, some of the university researchers uh, were very concerned about lock-in. You know, sometimes when you buy a solution and you, you're very pleased with the, the, the solution from your vendor, sometimes you get locked into that solution and that's, that's a problem. That can be a real problem. So you need to have the discussions about lock-in versus portability, right? Um, then I had another person say, well, I don't care about lock-in, you know, oh, sorry. I don't care about lock-in, right? I, I uh, where, where was that comment? Uh, there was someone who was much more interested to say, you know what? I just want my user communities telling me, don't change anything, you know. You can go to the cloud if you want to, as long as it doesn't change or my tools don't change. Just give me more of what I've got, keep going. So some people like to be locked in. Some people, you know, get good services from their vendors. So the, the whole issue about um, locking in, and there I did it again, uh, locking in versus portability, and whereas others will say, you know, I want the ability to be, to make sure that uh, I can move from one platform to the next, move from one vendor to the next, move from one technology to the next. And so that is often a factor. On-site versus off-site, and that was around the data center discussion. Uh, the University of Toronto Supercomputer Center is off-site. 
but they, and they don't own that data center. They're renting that data center. And as it turns out, the reason they got it, they got the, they got the floor space at a really good deal. They're, they, and someone else had built a four megawatt transformer in there for some other application and that business failed. And that would have been a, an over a million dollar retrofit that they got for free. And of course, they, got a, they, they really didn't have four megawatts of spare capacity on the University of Toronto campus, so they built their supercomputer center there. Um, but on-site versus off-site, most of the supercomputers in Ontario universities are on campus. Um, and that gets into the, the, the funding model as well, which is the things that I'm struggling with right now. Um, the cloud providers are saying, well, you know, we have economies of scale, we build large data centers, and we can re refresh the hardware on a frequent basis. You can't build it for less. You can't. And I go, well, you know, that's not what my architects are telling me, because the university supplies the data center. The university pays for the electricity. Research programs pay for most of the staff. So what we're looking at is we're looking at essentially a capital acquisition. And often through partnerships we get some steep discounts on the hardware. Often we get most of the software for next to nothing. So the build versus buy scenario in a university setting can be very, very different. Um, in fact, the way that uh, HPC is normally funded in Canada is through uh, a federal funding agency called the Canada uh, Foundation for Innovation. And their business is the funding of research infrastructure. And their mandate is to have universities build research infrastructure assets, which include supercomputing. So it's their whole mandate to deploy and build those assets into the universities. And it's a shared funding model between the federal and provincial governments, and the institutions themselves have to come up with part of the, the acquisition costs. So building assets in the university. Now the downside of that was that most of those assets are aging. Uh, in fact, because of the inconsistent funding, most of the supercomputing technology in Ontario universities is passed to warranty. So it's a serious problem. So on the one side, the funds are there so they could build up assets, which is great for a telescope or a microscope. But for, as many of us understand, HPC gets old very fast and needs to be refreshed on a regular basis. And so those funding models haven't changed to accommodate for that. Uh, interoperability uh, is very important. Uh, we need, we need solutions that um, work between different technologies and technologies from different vendors and uh, we heard something a little bit in some of the case studies about universities that need to work together across geographies. Uh, certainly in Canada, all of our universities share our HPC facilities uh, equally. So we need interoperability and it's a big part of the equation. Um, known costs, I mean one of the arguments put forward is that I need to know what my costs are. I have a CapEx budget, I need to build it, and I need to know the money spent, I just use that, and when it's full, it's full. Uh, they didn't want any surprises by going out to cloud services and all of a sudden get a bill at the end of the month for uh, a lot of services that they actually didn't have budget for. A lot of people have been surprised that way. Uh, we saw in some talks yesterday, security is a big issue. And in a lot of cases, the security solutions don't meet the, the protocols that are necessary in a specific sector. Certainly in the healthcare systems, security has been basically, you know what, we're never going to let the data outside the building. Well, that's one solution, but that's not a great solution. And so the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and the University Hospital are, from what I understand, and again, we was, this was presented in a case study in uh, San Diego in September, uh, there are two hospitals in Toronto that are sharing clinical and research data. Now, they're just across the street from each other, but that's the first time it's happened in Canada. And as I've talked to people around the world, there's not a lot of hospitals that are actually sharing data outside the walls of their building. Um, so that interoperability, that security aspect, because we have a lot of governance around private data. The data of patients is private data and it needs to be secured. So when you're building those solutions so you can move that data from one hospital to the next, from a hospital to a university, or from the hospital to the cancer research center, or perhaps even to uh, a, a, a another lab, we need to ensure the privacy of, of, of uh, people's data. And a lot of those solutions are only still being developed. One of the ones I like to often talk about is HPC is not the same as IT. And a lot of IT people don't get that. And uh, I think pretty well everyone here is, is very familiar with the distinctions, but um, it's not the same and that can influence what you need to do. And this is the big one that comes up on and again is, is, is people. 
in, in, the, in, the, in the phenomenal growth of data, the cry that we keep hearing, and it was addressed in one of the panels yesterday, there isn't enough people out there to do this type of work. And that gap is growing. Um, so, I mean, you may answer all the questions and say, you know, we really need to build, but you don't have the staff to build it. They don't have the expertise, or you can't hire enough people. And you may not have any choice. You may want to build, but you just don't have enough staff or with the right training or with the right background. So the, you need to take a look at your people and do they have, do you have enough of them? Do you have the right skills? Uh, and often what I've seen in, in small companies where they have, and again, I don't mean to be hard on IT people, but IT people are generally trained to support a system and keep it stable and provide reliable services to their customers. And often these IT people are brought on board to design new products. And what I, some of the companies I worked with will learn the hard way, you don't ask a support person to do design. It's a different way of thinking. And, and so you need to look at all of those things. The, the people equation, I talked briefly about the funding model, we all have, probably been involved in lots of discussions about total cost of ownership. Uh, in many cases, and, and with the researchers in the audience, I very much enjoyed talking a little bit to Captain Kirk last night. And uh, as he goes where no man has gone before, often he has to build his own solutions because he's exploring parts of the universe and looking out further. And sometimes you just have to build your own tools because they don't exist. Um, the importance of keeping technology up to date. And I've noted that our, our HPC systems by and large are past warranty. And when you go for a, a cloud services scenario, um, you're able to keep that open. And I see I'm really running out of time. So I want to get into some of my examples. Uh, there's two stories here, and I'm going to keep them brief. The build versus buy. Uh, we've all seen uh, the IBM Watson machine win at Jeopardy. Apparently the code name for, for that development was Blue Jay uh, until they went live with Watson. And, and uh, we have now uh, some Watson instances have been turned on in Toronto and the computer science department at University of Toronto uh, has a license for a Watson instances. And one, uh, there's actually an entrepreneur. It was, uh, he went to school at the University of Toronto and then did really well in Silicon Valley. He's come back and he's teaching this IBM curriculum in a computer science environment and the student projects he wants to turn into startups. And he's turned a couple of in, them into startups and one of them actually got second place in the IBM competition in New York City just, I think that was in late January. Um, and we, we brought some funding to this startup but they moved to Palo Alto. They just had so many opportunities. This was last September, a student project. It became a startup over Christmas. And now they have VCs chasing them. And this is a scenario where they took the Watson technologies and, and they built a series of startups. So now rolling this out, I believe IBM is going to, the goal is to roll it out across 100 schools in North America. Uh, we're trying to get 10 of those in Canada, started with the University of Toronto, I believe right now we're rolling it out in five universities in the province. I think four in Ontario, one out east. Um, and what they've developed with that is now they have this thing called Blue Jay which they've given the, their Watson instance a name. Blue Jay goes to law school at University of Toronto. So he's actually being trained on the uh, law, Canadian law. So that's the, that's the by example. We also funded a lot of startups, and this is a, a startup that we funded called Sciencecape. They also did a project with us with IBM. And they're building from scratch their own natural language processing. Now I recognize that Watson is much more than natural language processing, but they built their own natural language processing engine, which goes through scientific literature and does an intelligent search and actually provides a recommendation in engine. So you type in your field of research and it brings you relative articles. Much like when you ask uh, the Watson machine questions, you get answers. Uh, it provides a Q&A type from, from format. Uh, in this sense as well, it's providing you the answers you need for the research you need. need. Uh, there, I'm going to do this. I told a few people about this. I told John about this last night. So I'm going to ask if we can play the video and then I'll comment because my time is tight, but I think I'll fit it in. But this is a bioinformatics um, around life sciences at the University of Guelph. And I'll just play the clip here. This is our home. We live here. We share our home with millions of other species, most of whom we know nothing about. All these species are our neighbors and we're closely connected to them. The choices we make affect these species in many different ways. But if we don't know who our neighbors are, how can we expect to understand our impact on the planet's biodiversity? 
Using traditional methods, it's taken over 250 years to describe 1.7 million species. At this rate, it'll take at least 500 years to complete the list. Now, using new DNA-based tools, scientists are building a digital list of all living species on the planet. With these new techniques and help from people around the world, we can finish the list much sooner. Even you can help. Seriously, we can all make a difference. In Canada, the Biodiversity Institute of Ontario is home to IBOL, the International Barcode of Life Project. In collaboration with people and organizations from around the world, they've built a publicly searchable database of short, species-specific DNA sequences that functions like a barcode. Yes, a barcode, similar to the barcodes you find on your groceries, your books, and just about everything you buy. Just like these barcodes are unique to consumer products, DNA barcodes can be used to register and identify different species, even from larval forms or fragmentary remains. Here's how it works. DNA is extracted from any living organism. Its barcode is then amplified, sequenced, and submitted to the BOLD database along with information about where and when the specimen was collected. So far, over 70,000 species have been barcoded, and with the help from students around the world, they've uncovered some startling things. High school students across North America discovered that 25% of fish sold in supermarkets was mislabeled, and in some cases, at-risk species were found in stores. Meanwhile, in an apartment in New York City, a new species of cockroach was found. And across Europe, students are beginning to barcode plants. To foster global collaboration, IBOL is building a social networking game called the Global Biodiversity Challenge. The game is designed to encourage students in schools to collaborate with scientists and participate in DNA barcoding. Using these genetic tools, students can make new discoveries and address important social issues. So join the challenge! Compete to discover something new, gain points for your findings, get published in the BOLD database, become a citizen scientist, and most importantly, help all of us better understand our place alongside our neighbors in the web of life on Earth. And this is a, uh, this is a build example. They actually um, they built everything themselves. I mean, obviously they bought the sequencers, but they built their own HPC data center. We were hoping they would use the resources, the shared resources, but they built their own HPC data center and the search tools they built themselves. And they actually said, you know, there's anyone else that can use this technology and their search tools, uh, they've made it openly available for other projects. They do their, from sequencing to their databases, two hours. Now, they're not sequencing the whole genome, but they, they can go from a sample that comes by FedEx to identifying the species in two hours. And they're, they're trying to get that down to minutes. Uh, so this is another example in neuroscience. And again, I'm, I'm tight for time, so I'm just going to play. I've got two more video clips, and uh, we'll just comment very briefly on that. So if you could play this video clip. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. There you go. So I think this is the second last video. So we'll, I might need an extra minute or two, but it should be, it should be good. My name is Chris Eliasmith, and I'm the director of the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at the University of Waterloo. And I'm actually jointly appointed between philosophy and engineering. The philosophy allows me to consider general conceptual issues about how the mind works. But of course, if I want to make claims about how the mind works, I have to understand also how the brain works, and this is where engineering plays a critical role. Engineering allows me to write down equations and very precise descriptions which we can test by building actual models. One model that we've built recently is called the SPAWN model. This model SPAWN has about two and a half million individual neurons that are simulated in it and the input to the model is an eye and the output from the model is the movement of an arm. So essentially it can see images of numbers and then do something like categorize them in which case it would just draw the number that it sees or it can actually try to reproduce the style of the number that it's looking at. So for instance, if it sees a loopy two, a two with a big loop on the bottom, it can actually reproduce that particular style of two. On the medical side, we all know that we have cognitive challenges that show up as we get older. And we can try to address those challenges by simulating the aging process with these kinds of models. Another potential area of impact is on artificial intelligence. A lot of work in artificial intelligence attempts to build agents that are extremely good at one task, for instance, playing chess. What's special about Spawn is that it's quite good at many different tasks. And this adds the additional challenge of trying to figure out how to coordinate the flow of information through different parts of the model, something that animals seem to do very well. So they built their own simulator, they built their own model, they built their own language, and they're basically modeling the human brain. 
And the mo it models uh, neural firing, but the models perform cognitive functions. They can recognize and, and remember things. And they can also model degeneration of the, mem of the memory. So they, we have a computer model that can be used for neuroscience research and a computer model that can be used as an artificial intelligence system. And they've written, deliberately written so that it can run on many different platforms. And I got it on the blue gene, uh, about uh, our blue gene uh, just about a few weeks ago. And so they're able, they've never had that many cores before, so they're able to start modeling regions of the brain they haven't been able to model before and adding cognitive functions. But I am really tight for time and I, I appreciate just a few more minutes of your time. Uh, and this is a neuroscience that's not a build. And this is another one that plays a little bit, if you want to play that right now, plays a little bit like an IBM commercial, but I think you'll find this to be a good example. This is a scan of the brain at work. Using the IBM cloud and IBM technology, we've built a program that allows us to analyze the brain in real time. We're beginning to be able to diagnose network disorders like autism, schizophrenia, and Alzheimer's. Our program identifies each region of the brain with a circle, and then we connect these circles with lines so that we can see regions of the brain communicating. This can tell us which areas are working hard and which areas are under-functioning. In the past, a scientist would work really hard to gather a relatively small amount of data. Now we can gather enormous amounts of data, but the sheer volume means that we can no longer use our old analytical tools. The new tools we've developed have accelerated our work by an order of magnitude. Now we can do adaptive testing to activate and see different parts of the brain and get the results in real time. So something that took multiple visits now takes milliseconds. Neuroimaging is expensive, but we're making it more affordable by reducing the number of scans and getting results much faster. And that means less anxiety for the patient. I love the idea of being able to quantify neuropsychiatric illness. If I can provide data that helps patients legitimize their illness and helps people understand that these are real brain disorders, I feel good about that. So functional MRI is comp computationally horrifically expensive. So we were able with this project with IBM to be able to use some of the streaming data analytics in conjunction with F some FPG acceleration to, to make that available in real time. And thank you very much for your time and attention. And our time is more than gone, and thank you for the extra minute. We will make time for Ron. If you, if, Ron, if, if you have a couple of questions, we can take two questions for Ron. He was pretty succinct then. Thank you. Oh, I got one. Sorry. There's a question over there. Could you tease out the subtleties of HPC is not IT? Um, you know, you walk into a data center and it looks like the cabinets look more or less the same. Um, I just find that um, your parameters are different. I mean, in the simplest sense, HPC typically has extremely high utilization, whereas IT it has it, it tends to be more about reliability and, and repeatable services. So it's it's different software that's running the systems. It's different software that's used to maintain the systems. It's different requirements for the user community. The applications are different. In HPC, the applications are by and large parallel, whereas in, in IT, the applications are by and large serial. I mean, one of the things that we're doing in our public funding is the province of Ontario, the price of electricity is about double as the province of Quebec. So that's part of the competition in terms of refreshing the supercomputer centers. So we brought in a consultant to, to help us find solutions to our energy consumption. And the first thing they put on the table, well, you know, IT data centers uh, are very low efficiency and through virtualization we can improve your efficiency. I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, like HPC data centers are running at 99% utilization. You know, that's a completely different game. I get that in IT data centers, but it doesn't work in HPC. So that's one simple example. The utilizations are different. But I just find that the HPC people and the IT people, they have different training. Most of our HPC people have PhDs. Most of the IT people, you know, have a, a diploma from a, a technical college, right? It's, so the, the skills are different, the mindset is different. Again, 
you know, IT developers or IT support people. It, it is one kind of skill set to go out and get Cisco training and get certified and they make sure that their users get the same good consistent performance. Where in HPC, you get a PhD come sit down with a researcher and say, you know, how do I make this go faster? How do I enable your science? It's, it's very different both in the user support, the people aspect, but in the technology aspect. I hope that's helpful.